In November 2014, the MacArthur Memorial hosted a World War I Centennial Symposium in partnership with the Hampton Roads Naval Museum and the Old Dominion University Department of History. The following is a lecture by Mr. Joseph Hoyt. Mr. Hoyt is a maritime archaeologist who specializes in the archaeological recording of deep water shipwrecks. While at the memorial, Mr. Hoyt presented on the topic, Battle of the Atlantic, the East Coast of the United States during World War I. Uh, thank you very much. I'm re really glad to be here in my, my backyard. Before I start, I just wanted to say one thing with uh, Robert Shaw's presentation. For, for those of you that have never tried to identify a set of human remains, this is incredibly difficult work and, and very important stuff. For, my my primary, primary job is for the USS Monitor, and uh, when we recovered the, the turret in 2002, uh, we, were, we found the remains of two U.S. sailors inside the turret. And uh, over the course of about 10 years, we worked really closely with JPAC, the Joint Pacific Accounting Command in Hawaii, to try and identify those remains. Uh, full DNA analysis, we did uh, facial reconstructions with Louisiana State University. And we knew, who, uh, we knew that there were 16 sailors lost, so we knew generally out of a pool of 16 people uh, who they could have been. Uh, we knew where they w were associated with, and we still couldn't identify these remains. So it's just really incredible, important work that you're doing. So very impressive. Uh, I'm going to talk about a much lesser known battlefield, uh, some of the battlefields that are right here in U.S. waters. Well, many people are unaware that there are, uh, there are two um, world wars that came to the coast of the United States through the Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, so just a quick bit of background on, on who I am and why, why we do this kind of work. I work for a program called the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries uh, that's part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And our program is um, it's similar in, in ethos to the National Park Service. Uh, we have 14 sites around uh, the country and in U.S. territorial waters. For the most part, these sites protect special places in the world's oceans, focused predominantly on uh, natural or uh, ecosystem-based uh, preservation. We've got uh, the uh, Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary that protects a system of coral reefs, uh, the Hawaiian Island humpback whales, uh, the Papahanaumokuakea uh, Marine National Monument in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, where, by the way, we've recently found some midway uh, associated aircraft. Uh, however, there are two sites. The Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary is the only freshwater site that's in uh, Lake Huron. Uh, that protects about two to 300 wrecks that uh, are associated with uh, Great Lakes shipping and the USS Monitor where I work. So we have these two sites that focus predominantly on marine archaeology. However, the majority of these sites have some uh, uh, shipwrecks that remain within them. So towards that end, we have a program called the Maritime Heritage Program, which looks at uh, resources that are either within sites that predominantly focus on uh, ecological uh, resources or um, sites that are maybe outside of sanctuary boundaries that are historically significant that may be under consideration for inclusion. And uh, so really to give you a background on why we do this kind of work, we, we look at these things and w the archaeology contingent in my program has really started to look uh, into battlefield archaeology and landscape-based archaeology. And when we think about World War I, World War II, these are often considered to be foreign wars. Of course, the U.S. had a very significant involvement in these wars, but when we think of sites associated with those, we think of places like the Western Front, we think of places like uh, Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, these sorts of places. However, we've got well, World War II, we've got Pearl Harbor, um, but that's not part of the continental United States, and we don't really have very many sites that are associated with this. And, um, but that's not true for uh, the ocean wars of the Battle of the Atlantic. So we started in 2008 looking into the resources associated with German U-boat activity during the Second World War, uh, of which there was a, a much greater uh, amount of resources. Just in North Carolina alone, there's almost 90 vessels that were sunk in the first six months of 1942. Uh, so we've been focusing on this from this landscape-based approach. It was really interesting to look at this U-boat war um, and really kind of the, the, the time period that we're in now gives us a much better opportunity uh, to look at these things because when you look at uh, a landscape uh, on land, it's much more easier to, to get your head around it where you're looking at things like trenches and, and uh, operations of cover and fire. fire. Um, and when you look at a sea battle, it's much more difficult because you see sort of this flat expanse of the ocean. 
Uh, but now with, with uh, marine survey technology, with uh, advanced uh, advancements in geographic information systems, we're able to model these things in a way that we can really start to make sense of them because they took place over such a, a much more vast uh, geographical space. So, and particularly when you look at U-boats involvement, and uh, th this takes the naval engagement from what was always a, a sort of a flat plane uh, to a, really a 3D landscape where now you're interacting with the bottom topography and the bathymetry because the U-boats operate within the water column in this 3D space. And aerial surface uh, support comes from uh, stations, uh, airfields on shore. Uh, the actual uh, atmospheric column becomes important too. So now that we, we can kind of digitally reconstruct and model these and understand them in, in a way that we haven't before. So as I said, we, we started doing this uh, looking predominantly at World War II, and have done that now for almost seven years. And uh, in the process of that, we've started to look now towards the first Battle of the Atlantic, uh, which took place in U.S. waters in 1918. And really, our, our interest in this, as I said, is uh, we don't have these sites to remember the significance of these, these uh, uh, both World War I and World War II which arguably have shaped the modern world more than any other events in history. Uh, but we protect places like Antietam and Gettysburg and Yorktown and Little Bighorn. And uh, we set those places aside and say these are, these are where important things happen that change the course of history. And uh, we, we think that the battles of the Atlantic in U.S. waters can be that for uh, the First and Second World War. And they really haven't had sort of the popular attention that, that I think that, that they ought to. Um, so just to, I'm, I'm going to talk predominantly on, on just the, uh, the set of resources and activities that are in North Carolina waters, but just to kind of put it in context, if you're not familiar with it, I'll give you just a quick uh, basic background on the uh, World War I U-boat campaign. Uh, first of all, it's, it's important to note that the, in World War I, this is the first uh, major role that U-boats or submarines in general uh, took in any major conflict. Of course, David Bushnell's turtle was one of the first submarines that was used during the Rev Revolutionary War with, with no success. The first successful use of a submarine was uh, the USS Hunley against the Housatonic, I'm sorry, the CSS Hunley against the Housatonic uh, off of Charleston, South Carolina during the Civil War. Um, and it's interesting to note the reason that the, uh, the Confederacy developed submarine technology was because they were, it was clearly apparent that they couldn't hold up uh, anything against the Union Navy. So they started looking into these, these cheaper uh, ways that they could break blockades. Um, and submarines, and uh, as well as uh, submarine mines, became uh, a part of the Confederate uh, response to those blockades. Uh, however, there were never you know, really uh, major players in the, the overall war effort. And that, that's not so for, for World War I, but it's a similar uh, impetus for developing submarines on the part of the German Navy. Uh, again, much like World War II, the, um, the U-boat initiative and campaign took place really from the beginning all the way through the, the, through the end of the war. Uh, now, predominantly, this was fought around the British Isles in the Mediterranean. Again, this is the same case in World War II, uh, but there was a significant campaign in U.S. waters. Uh, now, I just want to talk a little bit about kind of why they're doing this, the British surface fleet and the um, uh, war on commerce. The, the idea here initially when, when the German Navy de was developing U-boats was, again, they were very convinced, and rightly so, that they had uh, the, the German high seas fleet really had no uh, comparison to the Royal Navy. They knew very well that if they were to go into sort of what would be considered a classic uh, Mahanian-style naval conflict that the, the Germans wouldn't stand a chance against uh, the British. So they began uh, to develop U-boats uh, with the initial idea that the U-boats would be able to sort of tip the scales a little bit. They could sneak out, sink some of the, the uh, British capital ships, the big uh, pre-dreadnought class uh, battleships. And uh, they were somewhat successful in doing this, but it was never enough to really uh, tip the scales to uh, balance the power to where they could have a, a real surface engagement. Um, but uh, th this is predominantly because of the way that U-boats were uh, operating in this time. They weren't quite uh, as efficient as they became in, uh, later in, into World War II. They were quite slow underwater, and uh, they couldn't really, they, they weren't really operating in uh, 
concerted wolf pack tactics like they did later in later years. Um, they really kind of had to set and wait and, and set up sort of a U-boat trap and you'd have surface vessels that would sort of try to lure the, the British Navy into an area where their U-boat's operating that could sink them with torpedoes. So it was pretty inefficient and uh, as, as the war moved on, beginning in early 1915, uh, it started to shift into this commerce war. And this is, this is a tactic that's been uh, a part of every major conflict in, in world history, really, is to cut off the enemy supply chain. And this is particularly effective against uh, Britain, which is an island nation. So at this time, you know, the vast majority of really every resource they had comes from the sea. So that's food, it's war materials, it's oil uh, that's fueling the war effort. Uh, the, the, the British nation really depended heavily on maritime commerce. So the idea here was that, um, well, the, the Royal Navy was blockading uh, many German harbors. The U-boats uh, could be used to get out past the blockade and go, go far afield and sink vessels uh, that were merchant ships that were carrying those supplies. And uh, this was very, very effective. Uh, however, it was somewhat ineffective in that, uh, at least early on, it was a somewhat uh, gentlemanly way of fighting uh, with the submarine. Now, su submarines predominantly are a very good uh, offensive weapon, but a very terrible defensive weapon. So they're, they, uh, th their success lies in their stealth and their ability to kind of have these surprise attacks. However, when they first started this war on commerce, there was a lot of concern over it being uh, sort of poking the beast of a lot of neutral nations. And of course, this is what happened with things like the Lusitania. When they, they declared that the areas around the British Isle were a war zone and they would sink vessels that weren't necessarily uh, involved in the conflict but were simply carrying uh, uh, merchant cargoes. So those are places like the United States, South America, other places that, um, that weren't involved. So they wanted to try and, and mitigate the losses that they had in that. So they, they observed these things called prize rules, which had the U-boat uh, kind of firing the per proverbial shot across the bow. They would board the vessel, uh, search the papers, look at the manifests, put everybody in a little lifeboat, give them a map and some food, tell them where to go to get to shore, and then put mines throughout the, uh, or, or bombs throughout the ship, and then sink it. It was very little loss of life, typically, and was considered to be more formal. However, that kind of negated the effect of a U-boat. Um, the U-boat would then have to paddle over to a large vessel with a small little rubber boat. They could p potentially be overpowered with small arms and things like this. So it wasn't really that effective. And much as it was, again, in the, in the Second World War, as the war progressed, uh, they began to s sort of relax those prize rules to where they would just slam a torpedo into the side of the ship and, and let it go or uh, place submarine mines throughout strategic ports and things. So we see that happening. And by the time that U.S. enters the war, uh, the, the prize rules have largely been relaxed. Uh, so, so that's sort of what's generally going on. Uh, the, the, the basic G German naval tactic here is to, to try and cut off the, sh uh, the shipping and also uh, sort of be a nuisance to the German or to the uh, Royal Navy surface fleet. The, during this time, uh, the United States, having this isolationist perspective of getting into the war, uh, is kind of on the fence of everything and. and the, uh, the Germans sent uh, sort of a, a goodwill mission uh, in a vessel called the Deutschland. This was the first ever merchant submarine, and uh, it was designed as a way for uh, the, the Germans to break the blockade so it would run out uh, under stealth, get away from the, uh, uh, the, Royals, uh, the Royal Navy surface vessels, and be able to carry, carry out some commerce. And th this was really more of a, uh, a token measure. It wasn't, th these weren't able to carry quite enough cargo to uh, uh, to really uh, be effective at, at large-scale commerce, but it was a way of saying to other neutral nations, hey, we're still able to operate, as well as a way to say to the German public that hey, we're still getting some supplies through, we've got these, these things going on. So the, uh, the Deutschland came to the U.S. in the summer of 1916, and uh, it was kind of greeted to a lot of fanfare. These guys were considered sort of celebrities, this cool new... Uh, submarine technology. They sailed into the Chesapeake Bay all the way up to Baltimore where they were docked for a number of uh, weeks. Uh, so this, this campaign kind of went on trying to sort of win the hearts and minds of America saying look, look, look at, uh, you should engage in commerce with, with uh, Germany. And it, it actually went over quite well uh, until about 
November of 1916 when another uh, merchant submarine called the U-53 uh, came on another goodwill mission and then shortly after it left Newport, Rhode Island, uh, began sinking ships just outside of territorial waters and kind of ruined its, uh, its goodwill with the, with the country. So uh, beginning, in, of course, in April 1917, the U.S. is involved in the war, and uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the uh, U-boat the threat starts to come to the, uh, to the U.S. So I'm just going to talk a little bit. There's, there's more going on uh, along the East Coast than I'm going to mention. I'm just going to focus on the North Carolina area and the particular U-boats that, um, that operated in this region and a couple of the vessels that uh, we know are lost in that area that we kind of hope to, to find and study as we move forward with some of our, our research projects in the field. Uh, so there were, there were three German U-boats that ended up operating uh, in North Carolina. It's the U-151, the 140, and the 117. Uh, this, this, kinda, this graph here kind of gives you an idea. This is the, uh, the destruction of vessels all up and down the coast. So this represents Massachusetts, North Carolina, New Jersey, Virginia, New York, and Maryland. Uh, and you see uh, Massachusetts and, and North Carolina have by far uh, the highest percentage. Now the difference here is that the, off of Massachusetts you've got major harbors and North Carolina doesn't have that, but what, what we've found in our research and looking at this landscape, North Carolina has some geographical features that are really lend itself well uh, to U-boat operations. I'll talk a little bit about that more, but um, it's really a, a kind of a U-boat hotspot for a number of reasons. So you see that North Carolina emerges as one of the one of the largest concentrations of losses uh, in, ton in both tonnage and in uh, number of vessels. So this this is just qu a quick map, and I want to mention my colleague Stephen Santergan developed uh, a lot of these these GIS maps to to recreate some of these sites. Uh, these are the vessels that are just lost off of North Carolina. There's ten vessels. Um, there we go. Sorry, uh, that just in in uh, a little over three months were lost. Uh, uh, off the coast here. The, um, you'll see here, I mentioned that the North Carolina is a very uh, good area for, for U-boats to hunt. You've got, uh, historically, North Carolina has terrible ports. There's very few ports in North Carolina that are navigable for large vessels. Uh, so the closest naval installation that you have is up here in Norfolk. Uh, so you're down here along this area where it's difficult for, for uh, uh, military vessels to, to access. And um, you'll notice here the continental shelf. This is, uh, th these different shades of blue are depicting the, the water depth. The continental shelf runs quite close to Cape Hatteras here. And because it sticks out in this area, uh, the ships that would, r would run up and down in the Gulf Stream would have to come past this point. Um, and this gives you a really good concentration of merchant ships, particularly as this is sort of where they would hang a right to head towards uh, British. Uh, they would ride that Gulf Stream, sort of like a, um, like a moving walkway in an airport to give them a few extra knots of speed. And uh, so U-boats would, would kind of hang out right here in this, this area as it was a steady thoroughfare for shipping. Um, and they also had access to deep water to hide. So this, this continental shelf was close enough to the shipping lane that it was a very, very attractive area for them to operate. And they were usually pretty far away from military installations. And because all of the uh, aircraft uh, fields in North Carolina are located on the inside of the sound here, and there's this, these barrier islands, the, uh, the, the coverage of aircraft was, was more limited here than really anywhere else. Uh, so th these are the vessels that were sunk um, just off North Carolina in, in World War I. Uh, I'm going to talk specifically about a few of them. Uh, you'll notice back here that these sites that are kind of further offshore in this, uh, this darker blue area, these are, are very difficult for archaeologists to access, for really anyone to access, because you drop off this continental shelf and you're in several thousand feet of water. It's a much more difficult area for us to work. Uh, it requires things like uh, remotely operated vehicles or, or submersibles, which kind of jacks the, the cost and complexity of, of doing operations. Uh, so the sites that I'm going to focus on especially are these ones that are in the uh, the shallower areas that we have, uh, uh, we we expect to be easier to locate, and uh, and and once located, easier to to, to actually uh, do some work on. Uh, so these are the three U boats that operated in, in North Carolina waters: the U one five one, the one four zero, and the one seventeen. Just give you a quick uh, background on on each of these patrols. Uh, 
This is the U151. This was uh, one of the more successful uh, U-boats that operated in the U.S. waters. This was built, uh, it was converted. The 151 is the, the, the class type that the Deutschland uh, was. It was, a, it was originally a merchant vessel that was then later converted to uh, a military vessel, which is why it only has two torpedo tubes. It didn't have the torpedo tubes and was initially built there, an add-on later. It could carry eight tor 18 torpedoes, was 213 feet long, and had a range of 25,000 nautical miles. This is really impressive because U-boats, uh, there, there was a bit of a, a dip in U-boat technology in the interwar period between World War I and World War II, and it was, this was, this was an impressive range for a vessel even in the World War II era. Uh, so they were really uh, quite, uh, uh, they had quite a lot of range. Uh, most of the vessels that were operating in World War II were really more of a uh, littoral craft that were never intended for trans-oceanic voyages. So this, this was a pretty impressive, impressive vessel. But you'll see here, you know, I only had a crush depth of 160 feet, so that's not very deep. But uh, this, was, this vessel here was um, on its war patrol to the U.S. They, would, they were filing daily position reports uh, in their war diaries and radioing them back that um, we were able to sort of reconstruct uh, from the positions given uh, throughout the Atlantic where it was at any given point that, there, that we have a record for. This is really interesting because it allows us to kind of recreate its, its path uh, through, the, through the area. This is, uh, this is just the area off of North Carolina and the Delmarva Peninsula here. Uh, as you can see, these are the vessels that it sunk, so it was quite successful. Um, it was I think the most successful of any of the vessels that were uh, that were lost uh, or that were operating in this area, and uh, I'll focus more specifically on the Harpathian. That's one of the vessels that we think is uh, uh, has potential to be discovered. But as you can see, this thing was really just kind of cleaning cleaning up here. There was no convoy system yet in place in this area, and uh, so it really kind of operated uncontested. Uh, Again, in this column here, uh, you can see that the vast majority of these were using bombs. Uh, so this is where they would actually flag down the vessel and go aboard, put people, uh, put people ashore, uh, and then, then detonate. However, some of them were, were not as lucky. And you can see the ones that were, where there were torpedo attacks or sh under shell fire uh, typically had much, a much higher loss of life. So they, they generally tried to avoid that when, uh, when possible. Uh, the U-140, this is a, uh, a monster U-boat. This was a, a, a U-cruiser. It was 300 feet long. It was almost 100 feet longer than most of the U-boats that were operating in World War II. Um, although these, these vessels were, left, these all were slightly different vessel type and uh, they weren't quite as standardized. Uh, shorter, shorter range, but still plenty of range to get across the ocean and, and do some damage along the coast here. It had uh, uh, four torpedo tubes in the bow and two astern. This one was built as, as, a, uh, as a military vessel initially, and uh, so it had more armament. Uh, this is a reconstruction of its uh, war patrol here. You can see as it crossed the Atlantic, it had more attacks uh, on its way over, uh, so we won't focus on those as much as we will on the, on the ones here uh, off the coast. But again, uh, not quite as successful as the U-151, but still quite successful in, in, uh, in sinking and damaging vessels. Uh, the U-117, this was a, a mine-laying U-boat. They were very, uh, this was very successful in that it mined the uh, part of the Chesapeake Bay. And the mining, uh, these mining missions that they would undertake were really more of a, a nuisance operation than a, an operation where they really believed that they would have any significant success. But as soon as a, a port was mined, or there was a perception that the ports could be mined, it would change and, and uh, complicate the tactics of, of ports all up, and, all up and down the coast. Uh, so it was successful in that, that just generating that notion of a threat uh, of mines it would uh, cost considerable more uh, on the part of the U.S. To, to try and negotiate that threat. Again, this is a big one, uh, 290, almost 300 feet long. Uh, and you can see the difference here, the, the 14, uh, 14 knots on the surface, seven knots submerged. This gap would close a little bit as you get into World War II. So these weren't quite as, uh, as able to uh, operate in, uh, uh, underwater as much as, as they were later on. They would generally hide underwater stationary 
and wait for uh, ships to pass, uh, come across their path, and then they would, they would sort of launch this sneak attack rather than actually operating and maneuvering underwater. This is a, a reconstruction of, uh, of its vessel, of its operation here on the coast. Uh, it sunk uh, the Merlot, which we'll talk about. That's one of the, one of the more interesting stories. And um, uh, it's uh, still yet to be found, but we're hoping to, to identify that. So this gives you just a quick idea of the, the comparative successes of the, uh, of the three U-boats that operated here, the, um, uh, the amount of tonnage that was lost, uh, the different types of technology that was used to actually sink the vessels, shell fire, bombs, and torpedoes. Uh, this kind of gives you a good cross-section of the different U-boat tactics that were happening in the area. So, so the first uh, merchant ship that we'll talk about that, that was sunk was the Harpathian. This was a British ship uh, that was 380 feet long. It was operating up here uh, kind of just south of the Virginia line uh, when it, was, uh, it started receiving some shell fire and then was, uh, was torpedoed. The, um, just to give you an idea of the difference in, in, uh, in some of these tactics, the, uh, when, the, when the Harbathian was torpedoed, the crew abandoned ship. There was no loss of life, but one of the uh, surgeons on board the, uh, the Harpathian was, was injured pretty severely. Uh, he was actually taken on board uh, the U-boat uh, the that attacked it. They patched him up. They gave him a bunch of tobacco and, and some uh, uh, beef jerky and things like this and pointed him to shore and said, head that way and you'll be, you'll be all right. And they, uh, they finished off the, the Harpathian to, sink, to put it on the bottom. Uh, but there, again, there was no loss of life here. And it was, it was a fairly uh, cordial way to sink someone's ship. Uh, the, uh, uh, but again, this one here, it's a little farther north than Hatteras. The continental shelf sticks out quite a lot further in this area. Uh, so we believe that this, this wreck should be in uh, something like 130 to, to 200 feet of water. So it's, it's still a manageable uh, area. Uh, the Mirac, you really can't talk about the Mirac without the Diamond Shoals light ship. This was um, sunk by the U-140. Uh, this was a pretty spectacular event. It was the only... Uh, with the, with the Diamond Shoals light ship was the only loss the U.S. Coast Guard had during World War I. And uh, the, the Mirac was, uh, was sailing south from Norfolk, uh, around, com coming around Cape Hatteras near Diamond Shoals, uh, when it started getting shelled by the 140, uh, which is an alarming thing to have happened to a merchant vessel. So it began uh, a zigzagging maneuver uh, that they were taught to, to do to avoid the, the possibility of being hit by a, a torpedo. Uh, basically it's sort of the idea of like running from a sniper and uh, in the, the process of doing this it uh, came across an area called Diamond Shoals and, it, and it, uh, although the shells weren't doing that much damage the bottom of the ocean uh, did so it's it slammed into the shoals and ran aground uh, and was stuck hard hard aground and still being shelled now during the process of this the, uh, the Diamond Shoals light ship, which uh, this was a purpose-built light ship that was built in 1899, uh, was anchored over Diamond Shoals for the specific purpose of warning ships that you could run aground there. And uh, it was sitting there, it was, had a crew of, uh, I believe, five folks aboard, and uh, it had this huge uh, mushroom anchor. And between firing up the boilers and removing that mushroom anchor, it generally took them about five hours to get underway. And uh, so it's not very, not very efficient. It was very much considered a stationary vessel. It usually didn't move at all and was, re was relieved by, by crew from another vessel. They were close enough to the, uh, to the Mirac that they were able to see the Mirac uh, being shelled and harassed by this U-boat. And they dutifully um, started radioing in this activity and the position to try and call for, uh, for some assistance uh, and uh, Unfortunately, the uh, 140 also had a radio and were able to hear this and said, well, we don't want that happening. So they, uh, uh, the Mirac was still hard aground, so they started steaming over towards the, uh, the Diamond Shoals light ship and began shelling that. Now, these guys, having about a five-hour process to get underway, uh, decided it would be better just to drop these these little lifeboats and, and head for shore. So they abandoned ship, and uh, this was actually sunk by, uh, by surface gunfire from the U-boat. Uh, after that sunk, uh, the uh, 140 returned to the Mirac and sunk that as well. Uh, so that brings us uh, to the Mirlo. 
This is the, the, uh, the last vessel that I'll talk about that's lost off North Carolina. We uh, are unclear again where this one is. This was a British tanker uh, that was sunk. Uh, I have it here saying that it was sunk by a torpedo. There's some, there's some speculation of whether it was sunk by a torpedo or sunk by a mine. We know that the mines were laid uh, in this area uh, by the 117. And some of the war diaries are confusing as to what vessel it, it, it hit with torpedoes versus where it laid mines. So it's possible that it struck a mine. Um, I think it's, I, I, would su I would suggest it's more likely that it struck a mine than was torpedoed, particularly given the, the crumminess of the torpedoes of the era. It often just bounced off your ship. Um, this story is of particular significance and interest to the U.S. Coast Guard. So this was, uh, it struck a mine just about 10 miles off of Wimble Shoals, and it was carrying fuel oil. And there were thousands upon thousands of gallons of fuel oil immediately spilled into the ocean and burst into flames. There were 52 crewmen aboard, and uh, they began immediately to manage ship. One of the lifeboats turned over into the fire, uh, while the others were, uh, were able to kind of cobble and get into the lifeboats. Now, meanwhile, ashore, uh, there's the Chickamacomico Life Saving Station, which is on the Outer Banks. It's crewed by, uh, by, by men around the clock. Uh, the captain of that Life Saving Station, Captain Midget, they, they can see this burning off the coast, and they get into their uh, surf boats, and they head out to try and uh, do, lend whatever help they can. When they get to the scene, there are, there's so much fire and smoke burning in this area, they really can't see much of anything at all, but they can sort of hear some calls for help. And there was an area that was totally engulfed with flames. They described it as literally walls of flames. Uh, there was sort of a uh, kind of an alcove uh, of, that was created by this circle of flames with just one tiny little opening, a corridor, uh, that they could paddle their lifeboat through. And these guys paddled in and uh, uh, their clothes were catching on fire as they were paddling in to, to rescue these guys. The, the boat in the center of this alcove was overturned with guys coming up shouting and jumping back underneath the boat um, to, uh, to, you know, almost certain that, that no one was hearing them. They come in, they pull six of these guys out of that area uh, and sent them back to shore. Then they then went around the flames and found another lifeboat where the men had uh, uh, all their clothes had been catching on fire, so they stripped them. They were totally naked, beating at things with their with their clothes. And uh, again, they were able to rescue those men as well. So it was this, really this harrowing story of uh, uh, of rescue. That, and the crew of the Life Saving Station was awarded uh, the Gold Life Saving Medal, which for the U.S. Coast Guard is the equivalent of the, the Medal of Honor. It's the highest honor that they bestow. So it's a really important uh, heritage for the U.S. Coast Guard in conjunction with the Diamond Shoals Lightship, which is uh, a Coast Guard asset, or would have been a Coast Guard asset. Uh, so what we've done, as I said, we, we were trying to look at these, these areas as part of this interconnected landscape. And so we've started to do some modeling. We've done a lot more of this for World War II. We're just sort of starting to get into it for the World War I. Uh, this is showing area that w would uh, reasonably have had uh, air, air coverage. Uh, where the enemy minefield was placed by the 117, the, the different shoals and, and uh, geographical uh, restrictions of things with the continental shelf. So we started to try to remodel this area to understand it better, looking at these different features in the landscape like the proximity to um, uh, onshore life-saving stations where things are. So you can see this is the minefield area uh, that where the U-117 set its mines. We believe that the, the Mirlo was in, in this area early adjacent to the Chickamacomico station here, uh, which makes it strange that no one knows exactly where these sites are, can, given that they're so close uh, to the shore. So that's kind of where, where we are now with our, our research and what we're planning on doing uh, beginning this summer is looking at, at where these things are. So we've started to try and figure out exactly where we think these things may be. The Harpathian, again, I said this, this looks there, there was a survey that was done in 1944 by a Coast Guard cutter called the Gentian uh, that was really trying to locate the remains of World War uh, II vessels. And it came across a vessel in this area uh, that it, it claimed was the Harpathian, but based on all the other vessels that I've been to from the Gentian survey, they didn't know where the hell they were. Um, but there's some, there's, some, uh, there's some possibility that this could be a search area to, to look in and, and locate it. So what we would do is uh, go out there probably with side scan sonar or uh, an underwater 
a vehicle called a, an AUV, which is an autonomous vehicle that you can, you can put underwater that would run a sonar survey uh, to try and identify the remains uh, of those sites. And then we would go with divers to try and identify and, and put specific site identification on, on the, uh, the wreck site. Uh, the MIRAC we believe is uh, quite, will, will present, present us with a pretty good opportunity to locate uh, this wreck, chiefly because of its association with the Diamond Shoals light ship. And we know the Diamond Shoals light was, um, uh, it was a stationary uh, asset that was charted. And as a result of that, it's the only vessel that we actually know its location currently. This is a multi-beam image that we collected uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of seasons ago. This little blurb here, which doesn't really tell you very much, uh, is the wreck itself of, of the, the light ship, light vessel 71. Uh, there is, I can't see it from my, the glare where I'm standing, but up here there's another little blip on the bottom, and that's that massive mushroom anchor that they were unable to, to, to pull up. Uh, so we know where this site is, and we know that the Merak had run aground and, and then was subsequently sunk within uh, visual sight of that, which would have been not much more than 13 miles, probably less, and, and we know its general direction from the reports of the crew uh, on the light vessel. So we think that it's, it's pretty realistic that we could uh, develop a, a survey that will allow us to try and find the remains of that site. Again, these are, these are difficult things to do in the, in the ocean. There's lots of uh, variables that have to be managed. But uh, given that we have the, those positions from the light vessel and all these other uh, uh, after action reports and things that are published by the Navy, we can kind of narrow down an area that we think is likely and then we'll run out there with a sonar and sort of mow the lawn and, and see if we can turn anything up. We usually will typically use a side scan sonar uh, or um, a, a magnetometer, which is somewhat similar to a, a metal detector, but it's a towed system that just detects uh, fluctuations in the ambient magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, so again, the, uh, the Mirlo is another one that we really like to find. This one has been perplexing to people for, for a number of years. There's a site that um, is in this area that is locally called the Green Buoy Wreck uh, that many people have speculated would be the remains of the Mirlo. Uh, however, we believe that that's actually the remains of uh, a World War II ship called the San Delfino. Uh, it has uh, some diesel engines on board and the, uh, the Mirlo would have had uh, uh, boilers. So again, that's when the expert, everybody's an expert that ever dives on a shipwreck. Right? So we're hoping to find the Mirlo. Uh, again, this would be a great story for the, uh, for the U.S. Coast Guard uh, and, and that, their heritage. We just signed a memorandum of agreement uh, with the U.S. Coast Guard to manage uh, the wreck of the Diamond Shoals lightship. So we'll, we will be going out this summer uh, to do a survey of this site and try and learn as much as we can about the vessel. It's, aside from having been sunk uh, as a result of World War II enemy action, which, by the way, the, U the U-151, uh, when it came into U.S. territorial waters, was the first uh, invasion of the United States uh, since the War of 1812. Uh, so we think this is, has, has great significance uh, to our national heritage, and uh, we will be looking at this vessel. So it's significant from that point, but from... Uh, just from a maritime uh, history and heritage standpoint, the vessel itself that was built in 1899 was a really unique vessel type. It was a composite construction. It was built in Bath, Maine, and uh, it was a, a purpose-built light ship. Uh, for the, so it's a very early uh, example of this unique vessel type. So it's a very rare, uh, a very rare shipwreck to uh, to be able to explore. And we have some other imagery of the site where it looks like it's reasonably well intact. So what I mean by composite built was. Uh, it was iron framed but had a wooden hull. Uh, so uh, obviously the wood in the seawater uh, degrades quite quickly so you have basically just the, the uh, sort of skeletal remains. Uh, that would be my only skeleton picture if I had it. But, um, of, the, of the Diamond Shoals light. So, so the, these, are our, these are our future efforts. We're hoping to, to get back out there and, and begin to characterize these more completely as we've done with uh, some of the wrecks associated with World War II. We've just completed, as I said, a, a multi-year study on World War II shipwrecks uh, and located the remains recently of, 
the U-576, which is a German Type 7C U-boat that still has 45 uh, sailors left inside. And uh, with, the, with the, the conclusion of that, we're moving on to these World War I sites to hopefully celebrate those, get people to understand that um, we do have a World War I battlefield here in America, and it can be visited um, if you just slap on some dive gear and take a look. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.